Jesus stood and cried out. Some versions say shouted out. Saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he said in reference to the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, or not yet, the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Lord, we pray that your fire might fall in Jacksboro, Texas. We need revival in the church, in our nation. And I thank you for Cornerstone Church here in Haskell. Can anything good come from Haskell? Can anything good come from the middle of nowhere? Lord, we pray that revival and fire and spirit would, would come afresh upon us. In Jacksboro, we pray for these revival meetings today that, that there will be... The, Lord, we would look at those and go, it's only one day. But Lord, would you hear a few of us here in Haskell praying for our pastor Josh? And we pray you will stand in his body and through, through his body proclaim a word that he, not even he could have prepared for fully. And Lord, stand in my body and speak through my mouth May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to talk to you this morning, church, about the fuel of the church. The fuel of the church. Uh, I've set up these chairs. I'm going to use them as an illustration in a moment. But uh, I asked my wife... Um, the other day, and then I think she forgot, and then she, I asked her late last night, have we ever run out of gas? And we had never run out of gas. Now, that's just not good. Now, I did forget our car at seminary one time. Uh, I was so enraptured with the Book of John class at Southwestern Seminary. We lived on Spurgeon Drive, just a block off the seminary in Fort Worth, and, and I just walked home. And left my car in the seminary parking lot. So I get up the next morning and I go out to the, the carport <laughs> and I'm like, our car got stolen in Fort Worth, man. So I go back in. I say, Gene, our car, where's our car? Our car's gone. And then I'm standing there going, oh no. I didn't drive home last night. I was thinking about the book of John. And she was kicking my backside all the way up the street as we walked to get our car. Um, she reminded me that she ran out of gas one time in downtown Fort Worth with her sister. You ever run out of gas? I've run out of gas, but not with Gina in the car. Thank you, God. Um, but you ever run out of gas, and you're, just, you're out of gas. You didn't mean to do it. It just, you ran out of gas. And you have to have fuel. Um, today, I want to remind you, I think, of, of what is very important to you in your life and the life of this church. I want to say you because you have to be first because you make up the church let me let me give you what i'm talking about and, and really just get there the fuel of the church you must believe that the holy spirit of god is the fuel of the church and here in john 7 very interesting early uh, in about halfway through the story of the three-year ministry of jesus he brings up in this hostile situation, they want to kill him. They're tired of him. The Jews, the Pharisees, they're like, let's go get this guy. We need him off the map. He's upsetting the equilibrium of our religious experience. We're tired of him. We don't want to hear him anymore. This guy's a false prophet. And, and during this week of celebration of when it's a reminder in these booths. You remember how God gave you water? You remember how y'all had no water and God provided for you in the desert? That's the context that we drop into John 7 when Jesus, uh, uh, very loudly, Jesus didn't do things loud. Not, not, he didn't speak loud. We don't find him crying out like this. He usually just spoke. 
But here it says he stood up on this last day and said, if anybody. Now here's, here's, the, here's a, a little more context for you. Now during the week, during this Feast of Booze, they would go to the Pool of Siloam, which is near the Temple Mount. They would, they would go and get water and a pitcher. They would bring it and they would pour it near the altar every day as a reminder to connect the desert experience with the altar sacrifice and the work that God does. When Jesus here says, he says, uh, he says on this last day, he stands up, he says, if anyone is thirsty, the first thing I want to ask you, this is conditional. Are you thirsty? And if you're thirsty, you've got to recognize that you're dehydrated, that you may be in a desert, that you may need, Jesus here uses thirst and water, you may need something in you that you have not allowed, or you maybe you're not pursuing, and this is where I want to go today. Because it's, it's a game changer for your daily existence. He says, if, if anyone is thirsty. Anybody thirsty here in Haskell? Anybody hungry for God? Thirsty for the Lord? Anybody, anybody willing to say, I want revival? Anybody willing to say, yeah, it looks pretty dry out here. Oh, I'm not talking about Haskell now. I'm talking about the United States of America. I'm talking about our nation. And, you know, it, it's one of the hardest days I think we've ever seen, seasons we've ever seen here in the United States. It's dry in this place. I mean, it's bad. And it can be bad with any political environment. I acknowledge that. However... I'm not talking about any, I'm talking about now. I'm talking about what we've accumulated in the last so and so amount of years, whatever you want to do with it. But right now, we are in a dry and weary place. And as Christians, before Jesus returned, it would do us well to be ready Amen. and to be full of God and full of the Spirit of God. When we start, uh, we can't even define gender anymore. Listen, man, I love everybody. I've got people in my family who practice the homosexual lifestyle. And I don't hate them. I love them. I would still eat with them. I will still hang out with you some. I'm not going to do all that you do. But I don't hate you. We're still family. We're still friends. I'm not going to disrespect the image of God in you. Whoever said that? Nobody said that. That's what other people have defined us as. That's not what God has said we're all about. Now, am I deputizing what God says is wrong? Absolutely not. But I'm still going to love you. We have a situation in our nation where spiritually uh, we're going backwards. And it, we are in deep trouble. Now, probably what's going to happen is not much is going to change. If it does, it's going to be through a sterilization using governmental purposes and practices and strategies to come and take control. And that's the pre-rapture, if you're a rapture person, if you're not a pre-tribulation situation. So I, did y'all see how I just covered all y'all? <laughs> Some of y'all might be post-trib. I don't know what you are. It doesn't matter because Jesus said, be ready. Amen. He said, be ready. <laughs> and, and, and listen, I, I want to encourage you to be ready as, as an individual and, and then collectively to say, you know what, we're going to be ready. Now, what does that look like? Is anybody thirsty for God? You know, I find a lot of times people will say, I believe the Bible. But then when I start probing them about their belief, and you look at the way they use their Bible or don't use it, you go, "What? I thought you said you believed. It's not enough for us to say we're going to stand on the Word of God because it's the Word of God. No, 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 no. It's enough for us to say we're going to stand on the Word of God because it's the Word of God. And we need to open our Bibles. We need to, man, let me move on. So it's conditional. If anyone is thirsty, 
conditional. If you're thirsty. Anybody thirsty? There's an implication there that some folks may not be thirsty for God. And I pray that we will be. I, it's a choice. If anybody's thirsty, I've got to see where I'm dry. Now, I moved to Granbury, Texas from Rui Doso, New Mexico. And I didn't want to move to Granbury. I moved there to live with my mom. And my, my dad died a little over a year ago. And my mom lived by herself for six months. And it wasn't going well. We came a year ago from right now, almost Thanksgiving. My mom was in the hospital. And I said, Mom, your days of living alone are probably coming to an end. I, and it wasn't good for her in the hospital. It just didn't look good. And I said, Mom, if you want, God's kind of been stirring us up. We, we, we may have been thinking we're moving. I didn't think it would be here. But if you want, I'll sell everything I have and we will move with, in with you. Rather than you, at some point, having to go to an assisted care center. My mom is uh, she's partially paralyzed. She's on a walker. Sweet lady. Love my mom so much. I didn't want to move to Granberry. I had no burden for Granberry until about three, three or four weeks ago in a prayer meeting at some friend's house. And God finally said, Alan, you ever going to get with my program? I have moved you to Granberry. That's it. Now get on my agenda, God said. And in a prayer meeting, I started weeping. And I said, God, I've got a burden for my town. It's growing. But I want to know that where I am is where I'm making a difference for God. That's why it brings tears. And up till then, I was like tolerating what God was doing. Well, he says conditional. Alan, where were you? You weren't on my program. Are you thirsty? And then he says this. If you're thirsty, then he says not only is it uh, uh, conditional, it's invitational. Yeah, look, let him come. And then he says, if you believe in me, come and drink. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. First of all, when we, when we get thirsty for God, you'll go to Jesus. Jesus is more important than any of our denominational structures, any of our power, political place. He's the, most, he's the only one that can make sense out of anything. Ultimately, it will all strip away. He says, he says this, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the Scripture says. So, it's conditional, but it's also an invitation. You can come. You can come. You can come today. You can come right now. You can come and say, God, I'm not thirsty. I'm not thirsty for you, God. During the pandemic, I think I said this last time, but during the pandemic, I started doing personal Bible studies, Devo's online. I've been teaching every day for two years, seven months. Every day. Working people verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through books of the Bible. I've taught through 44 books of the Bible. If I'm alive, I might get to teach through the whole Bible. I would have never thought I was the guy to do that. But the way it came about is I had to realize my personal Bible study was horrible. And it, I was like, oh, no. At the pandemic, I was like, my personal Bible study is bad. I was counting sermon preparation as my personal Bible study and leaning back on, I know how to do it. I've done it before. God doesn't want us to go, I've done it before. He wants us to go walk with me every day. Whatever that looks like. That's not a guilt trip. But I had to admit where I was. I wasn't thirsty. Then I had to say, God, I'm coming to you. I want you to put a fresh anointing on my life. And let me ask you this, does this scare you that the anointing of God in a way that, that is manifest would leave your life? Now, if you're born again, you can't lose your salvation. Amen, Alan. Everybody say amen. All right, amen. And listen, if you disagree with that, we love you, man. 
we give you full margin to be just totally wrong. Okay, I'm, I'm kidding. That's overplayed, right? But, but when you got saved, you got saved. It's an invitation to come and to receive Jesus. And when He stands up in the midst of this time where they should have been saying, it's a dry day. This guy's shown up. He's doing miracles. This guy... He's the fulfillment of all that we believe. Instead, they stay dried up and they miss the best thing that could have ever came to their lives, which was Jesus. Now, this is an invitation. Come to me and drink. When you got saved, you started drinking for God. Isn't that odd to say in church? When you got saved, you started drinking. <laughs> because some of us who used to drink, we know what we mean by that. It says this, the one who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So this is the experience part of God. It's the transformational part. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying when you recognize where you are, you're dry, and you recognize that, that there's an invitation that I'm giving you, and when you respond to that invitation by faith in who he is, he says there is a transformational process that happens. And that is what I want you to leave with here today is a fresh desire for the Holy Spirit to guide your life. When he says this, he says, whoever believes in me, from his innermost being, this means his, kind of like his bowels. It's, uh, I meant to look it up, but it's the same um, topic if it's not the same word. I didn't look it up. In, in, in Matthew 9, Jesus is teaching, preaching, and healing. And he's going through all the towns. Then... It says that once he got out there like that, he saw the crowds. Remember, he saw them and he had compassion on them. I'm not sure it's the same Greek word here. I didn't look it up, but I can tell you this. There was an emotional attachment that Jesus had to the harvest. And I can tell you that that emotional attachment is connected to the Holy Spirit in us. I am not talking about emotionalism right now. So if your mind is starting to go there and think, man, what's Josh done? Did he invite a Pentecostal guy? No. I'm not a Pente I don't, yeah. Nope, we're not Pentecostal. We are saying that there is a transformational power that's transcendent. God left heaven, became flesh, lived, died, fully died, was buried, and three days after he was in the grave, three days he had been sitting there, laying there in the grave, three days after he, he got up from the dead, and, and then, 40 days later, he ascended. He went back into the presence of God. That's transcendent power. And somebody better be able to bring some transcendent power up into our lives. Because if nobody can do that, we are in deep trouble. What happens to me at the grave? I just go in the ground? Are you serious? I can't believe that. I refuse to believe that. I have a higher value for human beings and creation than to believe it's all over at the grave. So there's a transcendent power that God brings. And that power is, is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And that power is the same power that lives in every single believer. Now why do I bring this up this morning? Because most Christians live below the the joy of the spirit-filled life. When I became a Christian in 1988, I didn't know any Bible. I didn't know any church. I'd gone to church a few times, but I didn't know any church. And I got a Bible. I didn't know this stuff. But I started to hear phrases like the abundant life. And then there was the spirit-filled life. That's a Charles Stanley term, if you know Charles Stanley from First Baptist Atlanta. The Spirit-filled life is a life that you can enjoy God's Spirit. Now, I got these chairs here, and I want to show you three different aspects to the Holy Spirit this morning. Now, there's three chairs because this chair is the chair of the unbeliever. 
This chair is the chair of the believer. And this chair is the chair of the believer that is not walking with God right. In other words, this, this Christian has come over here and gotten into some sin of some sort, whether it's one minute, one hour, one day, ten days, a year. Doesn't matter. This is what we call the third chair. The third circle. It's the Christian who's away from God. This is the Christian who's abiding in Christ and His work. And this is the Christian who is not... That, well, excuse me. This is not a Christian. <laughs> I'm getting excited about this. And here's the deal. Let's go with this one. Before you became a Christian, this chair is you. Unbeliever, not believing... You are the natural man of 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural man does not understand the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. So here's the deal. When you're here, before you became a Christian, here's your relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would convict you. That's what He would do. Now, does that mean the sovereignty of God did not save you? No, of course he saved you from some things. I can still remember being a drunk, being in bars I shouldn't have been in. This wasn't last month, guys, okay? It was 30 years ago. But it still feels, it still feels like it was yesterday to me because of what the devil stole from me and how dumb I was. And the Holy Spirit, John 16, 8 says, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. It's conviction. It's conviction. When you are not a Christian, you come under conviction. Now, when I met my wife, Gina, here on the front row, the lovely Gina, I love her. Oh, my God. I met her on a blind date. I am here because of a blind date. A blind date. Well, when I met her, we started going to chapel in Germany. I was still drinking. And when I, and when I say drinking, I don't mean I had a glass of wine, okay? If there was a glass of wine, it wasn't going to be a bottle or two. And then we'll do some tequila shots. That was Alan. And then I'd be sick, right? <laughs> when I met Gina, we started going to chapel. That's church in the military. I was in the army. And the chaplains would always seem to be talking about drinking. I would go and be sitting in church, and it seemed like they were always saying, now this is what the Bible says about alcohol. And I, just, I was like, Gina, you're calling this guy. You're calling him Saturday night, telling him we're coming to church Sunday morning. He's preaching at me. He's preaching to me. Well, that never happened. That was the Holy Spirit convicting me in this first chair. He will wear you out with conviction. If you, and what he's tapping into is that image of God. You're created in the image of God, and yet Genesis 3, the fall of man, sin hit the world, and there's something wrong with our hardwiring. We know it, and that's where guilt starts to hit. And then the Spirit of God confronts you in those moments where he's going, hey man, you ought to let this go. You ought to leave it alone. You need to run from this. You're not happy. All that stuff. You're not happy here, Alan. You, you, you are miserable. Why are you staying here? And I remember I used to quench the spirit. I used to grieve him. I'm sure God wept over the times I stayed right here. Yeah, th th this, is, this is the transformational part where we experience God. And he says this. He says in John 7, the one who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his innermost being, that transformed life, will flow rivers of living water. But notice verse 39. But this he said in reference to the Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. We haven't mentioned him much in John until now. He said it in reference to the Spirit. This is parenthetical from John. Whom those who believed in Him were to receive for the Spirit was not yet given yet because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And so, so here, the Spirit of God brings conviction on the unbeliever. And then what happens is we're, we're faced with that conditional part. If anyone is thirsty, you thirsty over here, Alan? 
Are you thirsty? Now, if you're a Christian, you're no longer here, but you face the conditional part as a believer to say, do you remember what it was like over here? Or did you get over it? And if you got over it, you need to get back to where we realize we weren't always saved, my friends, for those of you that are saved in this room. You weren't always born again. Now, I was a binge partier, but homegirl here on the front row, Gina, she got saved when she was five. She didn't have this big blow-up life. But we both have the same sinful nature that came from Genesis 3. This chair is a dangerous chair. It's a chair we want to get out of. And, and here's what happened next. Here's what happens next. I want, to, I want to show you. Before salvation, He comes upon you and he, he, he convicts us. He's with you is what I would say. He is with you. He's with you, but He is not yet in you. So here's the second step to the Holy Spirit's role in your life. You become sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I'm using a new Bible, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn in this Bible and actually see what it says. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. I could quote it, but I want to see what this says since it's a new Bible. Let's have some fun in church. Here's what it says. In Him, you also after listening or hearing the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you heard the truth. The gospel, the good news of your salvation. Having believed, having believed, go back to John 7, whoever believes, if you're thirsty, believe, come, drink. Having believed, we've said we're, we're thirsty. Notice what he says. You are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the first installment the New American Standard says here. This is the New American Standard 2020. Uh, who is the first installment of our inheritance. And okay, what does that look like right here? Here's what happened when you got saved, my friends. The Holy Spirit of God sealed your soul by His Spirit. He sealed you with a seal that can't be broken. Now I'm, ta I'm saying that now I'm talking about really being born again now. I'm not saying once saved, always saved. I'm saying if saved, always saved. And, and I'm not against once saved, always saved. I just think there's a better way to say that. Because there are some people who think they've been saved, but they have not. Well, how do you know that? Because their lives never changed. There was never any born again experience at all. And I can't draw a list of things. That would be judgmental. Only by the Spirit would a person know that. I was like that. I thought I was born again. But then after eight years, an eight-year period, right here. And I met her. And I'm sitting in church in this chair, and God's got me sitting right back here over in the back. And he's going, Alan, I've got you right where I want you. And I sat there going, I was in this chair. I'll just sit in it. I was in this chair going, oh my gosh. What do I do? And I mean, I had people, I was in the middle of the pew, and I had people all around. The church was packed. Gina's dad was preaching. And I was going, oh my. Where am I? I didn't say anything out loud, but inside I was going, God, where am I with you? I've been on an eight-year run. And I don't know what to do. I made a profession of faith when I was younger, but it don't feel right. Now, did God save me when I was younger? Possible. But I wasn't going to give him that. And I sat there and I said, Lord, my life's a train wreck. I wanted to stand up and say, all you Christians, y'all be quiet. I don't want to hear your stuff about God forgiving. I don't want to hear a word. You don't know what I've done. And God basically by his spirit, not out loud, it wasn't an audible voice or anything freaky, but God said, Alan, you shush. Shh. You're the one that doesn't know what you're talking about. I've got you right where I want you. You're under conviction right now. I want a yes or no. Are you in or not? I will forgive you right now. And that morning, I prayed and I said, Jesus, I don't know where I am with you. I've train wrecked my life. But I gave my heart to Christ and he sealed me with the Spirit. Now, nobody told me that, by the way. Nobody called me aside at the church and said, now, Alan, step over here. We want to tell you, we, we've got a, we have a blowtorch over here. We're going to seal you with the Spirit. No, no, no. 
No one laid hands on me. I wouldn't have been against it, but I might have thought it a little freaky back then. I don't know how I would have responded to that. Probably would have been okay. But it doesn't matter because God does that. When you heard the gospel of your salvation and you believed, you were sealed. And you were sealed, my friend. But not only were you sealed, check this out. You were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here's what it says. Um, let me just turn to it. Oh, I've got the scripture. I'll just read this from the Net Bible. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, we were all made to drink of the one spirit. Now, let me go back. This is Paul in Corinthians. He's talking about spiritual gifts. Remember, 1 Corinthians 12. But he's trying to talk about the body. But I want you to notice, notice this key thing. For in one spirit... We were all believers. We were all baptized into one body. When did you become a part? Let's do a Bible study right now. When did you become a part of the body of Christ? Not the, not the physical church, but I mean the body, the spiritual body of Christ. When did you become a part of the body of Christ? When you got saved. It was not when the church voted on you. That's the visible church. We're talking about the invisible, the born again. There's many people in the visible, well, there's at least some folks in the visible church, they're not born again, they've signed cards. And they've gone to the membership class, but I'm going to tell you something. When you're born again, you know it. When I, when I made that decision, I didn't realize this, guys. I didn't realize this. But at the same moment, I was sealed with the Spirit. There was a baptism of the Spirit of God. It feels good to say that in a Baptist church. Amen. I'll tell you why. Because our Pentecostal friends make it out to be something freaky. They'll lay hand, and Listen, Pentecost, if you're Pentecostal in the room, we're, not, we're family, okay? I don't mean to... But I'm just saying, Pentecostals will say, yeah, come down the aisle. We're going to lay hands on you. And if you're really baptized with the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. And uh, it'll be evidence with tongues. And that's how we, some of them say, that's how you know you're saved, if you speak in tongues. And we're going, where'd you get that? There's a couple of scriptures that they stretch. And they stretch those scriptures by ignoring other scriptures. When did you become a part of the body? When you were baptized with the Spirit. You were baptized when you had, Baptized by the Spirit when you had faith in the gospel, good news of Jesus. He baptized. For me, now that story will look different. You haven't thought about this. But that story will look different for every one of us. For me, it was, I describe it like this. That baptism of the Spirit was a six-month wave that I was surfing. I mean, I was paddling, got up, and I mean, God began just... For a six-month, one-year period, I don't know how to describe it. But my life began to change. From your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And I stopped drinking immediately. I drank a couple of times after, and I, don't, I wasn't partying. I, I tried to drink a beer or two here or there, and I was like, ah, this, this doesn't work for me. I'm, I don't want it. First of all, it doesn't work for me too. I'm scared. I, I don't want it to, I know what it's done to me in my past. I'm not touching it. I'm not judging anybody else. I'm just saying I'm not touching it. And God helped me. He got me off of pornography, which I didn't have an addiction or anything, but I had an immoral past. And God began to knock them dominoes down. I stopped cussing. It took me a whole year to really stop. Some things get the baptism. This baptism of the Holy Spirit is to transform life. It's when you begin to change. And, and it's maybe right now, in some of you in the room, you're reliving that moment. You're reliving that period right now in your memory. You're, you are thinking about how God changed you. And you're, you're inside right now. You're going, yeah, you're right, man. You are so right. Because you began like a hand glider. 
The Spirit of God, the wind of God began to blow and you started to sail with God. You looked at life different because inside He sealed you to protect you and then He baptized you by His Spirit to change you. But then there's one more. There's one more. This third chair is what happens after you're saved. Notice this. He says this in Ephesians 5.18. Do not be, do not get drunk with wine. Look at that metaphor, that imagery. I, I think it's fascinating. Which is debauchery. I'm using the net Bible there. He says, don't be drunk with wine, which is debauchery. Or reckless living is a better way to smooth it out so we get the meaning of it. So we don't have to look up the word debauchery. But be filled by the Spirit or with the Spirit. Be filled by is probably better. Here's what happens. When you get this third chair, what will happen is you're a Christian, but you still have a sinful nature. Your relationship with God is based on the cross of Jesus Christ. Your fellowship with God is based on your obedience and desire to walk with God. And there are those times where we'll get over in this third chair. And we won't be as filled. We have been baptized with the Spirit. We are sealed. We are good to go. We've been changed. But there are those times and those seasons where we get over in this third chair, this carnal, worldly Christian life. And, and, and the spiritual man is by faith. But this one, we stop walking by faith. And here's what happens. We start to sin, and the, and the Spirit of God, He hasn't left us, but He is nowhere near full in us. And when you get over here and you stop walking with God, your desire is just not there. You're not thirsty and we're not thirsty. And that can happen in one minute. It can happen in a one hour period at work. And we have to say, Lord, fill me with the Spirit. Notice this. It's a command. Be filled by the Spirit. It's a command. But it's also passive. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Or by the Spirit. But it's a command. So he says, get to the place of filling. But it's passive in this. Once you get there, let it happen to you. You just stand there. And in the beginning of this message, I said, did y'all sense the Holy Spirit in the singing? I did. I started weeping a little. I had to wipe my tears. I was so glad. I love it when I can come to church and sense the Spirit of God. I love it when I get around you all or other Christians and I sense the Spirit of God. Why? Because I don't get that anywhere else in my week. Church gatherings ought to be the most uh, experiential. Uh, They ought to be the most, uh, the, the, the environment we desire most all week. But there ought to be, if I can just have one moment in my heart with the Holy Spirit that morning, Hallelujah, I'll take it. And he usually gives much more than that. And it's a continual pursuit. Be filled. It, it, in the language, it means constantly be filled. Always seek to be filled. Notice the intoxication metaphor here. He says, don't be drunk with wine. Don't be intoxicated with this world's liquids but be filled thirst be filled with my spirit let me quench that thirst i used to mask everything with alcohol back in the day i masked it. i ran from my problems i I just tried to pickle myself out of my life and that's what people do in some kind of way whether it's alcohol or other things can i give you another scripture Parallel scripture from Colossians. It's the same, it's the same verse. 75% of Colossians is in Ephesians. Or, no, let me say it the other way. 75% of Ephesians is in Colossians. And here's what it says of this same verse. This is Ephesians 5.18. Listen to this same verse in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. It's God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. This book, people go, well, it's just the Bible, men wrote it. You have not done your homework. I dare you just to study any of the manuscript evidence for this book. First of all, it will blow your socket when you see how deep that 
topic goes. It will blow your mind. We've got manuscripts. We've got minuscule, which is small Greek. We've got majuscule, which is large Greek letters. We've got pottery. We've got paintings. We've, this book has been, this is not something that just four guys got together and said, we ought to write a book. That is impossible. The Word of God richly dwelling in you by the Spirit of God. He's anointed it. Every time you open your Bible, God opens His mouth. Every time you engage the book, just keep engaging it. Sometimes it's going to be boring. We did devos for a month online in the book of Leviticus. But now we're reading the New Testament and talking about atonement in 1 John and all the people that went through Leviticus are going, Oh man, that makes sense now. That was stoked up. The Word of God in us is what produces this. And both of these passages, Ephesians 5.18 and Colossians 3.16, say this, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. When we come and sing, there's just something about it. There's this, I love this worship here. I was like, my gosh, this is dynamite. And there's 30 of us in the room. And we're worshiping the God of the universe. And we can sense his presence. It's not just emotion. It's transcendent. It's more than emotion. Amen. It's deeper. Well, this is the fuel of the church. And here's what happens. When we get over here, we've got to say, God, fill me with your spirit. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you pray, God, fill me with the spirit? That's a prayer you should be praying now, I'm working at Chick-fil-A. I work part-time at Chick-fil-A. I'm just a normal guy. I just work wherever they tell me to work. I didn't want to live off my savings account forever, so I thought, we, I'm going to go take on a part-time job. And a friend of mine said, you should try Chick-fil-A. They're friendly to pastors. I said, really? I went over. They hired me. I almost died in the first 40 days. I mean, I am 58. I am not used to running like that. I am not used to that kind of work. That is amazing stuff there. I would come home and just noodle after four hours, just fall into bed. I've learned so much, though. The company lives up to the hype. But there's a point where one of the duties, no matter what you do, everybody, even the owner, I've seen the owner do some of the most lowly jobs. There are no bosses. And again, I, I've been Army 11 years. I've got a few degrees under my belt. I'm not new at this. And I'm telling you, I've seen the owner do jobs that the new people do. One of those jobs is to go and get sweet tea. We all love that awesome Chick-fil-A sweet tea. Oh my gosh, i got to stay off of it. And you take this bucket and you get the tea and it's better if you use the spoon and you mix it. And then you take this square pitcher and you take it and you've got to lift it up so if you're short you're you're looking for Alan <laughs> and so I will take this and every single time I pour it I pray Lord don't let me spill this first of all but at the same time almost every time I pour that tea I'm going Lord will you fill me with the spirit here at the job I don't want to have an attitude. I want you to control my mouth. I want you to control my mind. I want you to control my thinking. And Lord, fill me with your spirit right here in this place. There's been a couple of people that have come up to the counter when I'm taking orders. And uh, the other day, a guy came up and he was like, I took his order. It was breakfast. Now, I'm not used to the breakfast menu. I don't work mornings. But they asked me to work. And I said, sure, man. So I come in and... Um, this guy comes up, and I, and I couldn't, I wanted to make sure I got his order right, so I was looking for the bacon, egg, and cheese button, and I, I was just not wanting to rush on that order, because I, I don't want, we don't want to mess up orders at Chick-fil-A. We want them to be right. No food sits there more than five minutes. It's fresh. Well, I take the order, I'm taking it, and he goes, is this your first day? I wanted to come over that counter and say, sir, I've been somewhere. I've been to Iraq and back. I wanted to say, sir. Well, I did kind of say a little something. He says, is this your first day? I said, well, no. I said, I've got a few years Army, though. Doctoral degree from Gordon-Conwell. By the time I was saying all that, he was walking off. 
And then I thought, what, what makes him do that? Well, what makes him do that may be this. And if he's a Christian, I would never think to say to somebody, is this your first date? Or are you just dumb? That's not of the Spirit of God. What am I saying to you right now? I want to give you a challenge to pray to the Lord. Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Pray that prayer more. In your home, on the workplace, in the car, wherever you are. Before you speak, and probably I should have prayed that a little before I responded to him. I wasn't rude, but I thought, oh, you need a little comeback here. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will not tell you to be quiet. He'll say, say something. He's got a lot of traits. Comforter, shepherd, convictor, empower. And, and if I could end it like this, guys, I'd know it's time to end. He's the fuel of the church. Jesus gave us a precursor. The Holy Spirit had not yet been given yet. In Acts chapter 1, how did they get ready to experience the power of the Holy Spirit? They went and prayed for 10 days. You know what I love about your church? You guys pray before the worship service. That is the most oddball, backwards, Baptist thing to do. Everybody that's Baptist knows we do Sunday school. We don't do prayer meeting. What in the world are y'all doing? Oh, I, I forgot. I forgot. You have a pastor. <laughs> and we know Josh. He was an intern at First Baptist Rui Doso. We know Josh. His heart, he wants to he reach up to heaven somehow. And he wants God to be a part of what y'all are doing. Man, if that don't speak to you, I guarantee you, you had another pastor here. And I'm not trying to do anything, but... Uh, I'm not trying to bash anybody that might come in, but I'm saying if you had another pastor come in, they're going to go, why we do prayer meeting during Sunday school? But I'll tell you what, I'd be hard-pressed to give up prayer. Prayer is the conduit for the power of God. Amen. Prayer is the, that, and it's not just the meeting, by the way. It's in the car, it's all day. I know i got to stop. But, but I want to encourage you to pray. Because in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and that is where in Acts 2, 42, uh, 41 and 42, 3,000 people got saved and baptized. You want to see Haskell come to Christ? Start praying for the lost. You want to see, do we want to see God move? Get a burden for Granberry. Allen, goodness gracious, it took you seven months. But I'm getting a burden for my town. I'm getting a burden for people. I'm starting to come out of my lack of, my desert dryness and ignoring God. And God's been filling me. Well, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to give you an invitation just for a moment. Would you stand with me? If you have never given your life to Christ, and maybe you're in here going, my gosh, who's this dude? This is crazy. I, I'm just Alan. God's called me to preach. I got saved, and that's it. And you can be saved too. You could be born again this morning. It all starts in a moment when you say, I'm thirsty. I'm going to come and drink. I believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. God, seal me. I'm ready for this life change that you talk about. And if that is you, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you want to come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask you to come up front and just maybe sit or get on your knees or stand. And I'm going to ask you to make a public decision today for Christ. I'm going to ask you to do that. If there's someone in this room. Now, can I do one more thing? There's some of you maybe, you need a fresh filling of the Spirit of God. Really, you need a fresh filling of the Spirit. You haven't asked God, you're dry, and you're just in a place. I have no way of knowing this, by the way. I don't know, I, don't, I could not possibly know what's going on with you guys. But I don't want to preach a message like this and not give somebody an opportunity to come and stand right here. I want to pray that the Lord will fill you with the Spirit. It's not going to be anything freaky. Please don't go there. But I'm going to ask you, and sometimes just moving from where you're standing and, and coming to an, an altar of the front, there's just something about that that can be transformational if you want to do that. You don't have to do it. Because I'm going to pray the same prayer for all of us. I'm going to give you a moment with God. But if you want to come, would you come right now? Anybody want to just step out and say, you know what? I haven't stepped out in an altar in years. I need God to fill me with the Spirit of God. I need God to 
and you fill in the blank. Anybody want to do that this morning? I'm going to wait just a moment. Anybody want to step out and just say, you know what? I want God to move afresh on me, and I'm going to step out. Would you come? Come right now. We're not going to be long. Back in the church, we used to wait a long time until somebody came. We're not going to do that. <laughs> Anybody want to come and say, you know what? Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill me afresh. Lord, I've been a, I've been a toad lately. Lord, I haven't been agreeable to your will. Would you move in my life? 